Winston Churchill was one of the best known, and some say one of the greatest, statesmen of the 20th century. Though he was born into a life of privilege, he dedicated himself to public service. His legacy is a complicated one, he was an idealist and a pragmatist, an orator and a soldier, an advocate of progressive social reforms and an unapologetic elitist, a defender of democracy, especially during World War II, as well as of Britain's fading empire. But for many people in Great Britain and elsewhere, Winston Churchill is simply a hero. Sir Winston Leonard Spencer Churchill was a British statesman, soldier, and writer who twice served as Prime Minister of the United Kingdom, from 1940 to 1945 during the Second World War, and again from 1951 to 1955. Apart from two years between 1922 and 1924, he was a member of Parliament from 1900 to 1964 and represented a total of five constituencies. Ideologically an adherent to economic liberalism and imperialism, he was for most of his career a member of the Conservative Party, which he led from 1940 to 1955. He was a member of the Liberal Party from 1904 to 1924. Of mixed English and American parentage, Churchill was born in Oxfordshire into the wealthy, aristocratic Spencer family. He joined the British Army in 1895 and saw action in British India, the Mahdiist War, also known as the Anglo-Sudan War, and the Second Boer War, later gaining fame as a war correspondent and writing books about his campaigns. Elected a Conservative MP in 1900, he defected to the Liberals in 1904. Asquith's Liberal government, Churchill served as President of the Board of Trade and Home Secretary, championing prison reform and workers' social security. As First Lord of the Admiralty during the First World War, he oversaw the Gallipoli campaign but, after it proved a disaster, he was demoted to Chancellor of the Duchy of Lancaster. He resigned in November 1915 and joined the Royal Scots Fusiliers on the Western Front for six months. In 1917, he returned to government under David Lloyd George and served successively as Minister of Munitions, Secretary of State for War, Secretary of State for Air, and Secretary of State for the Colonies, overseeing the Anglo-Irish Treaty and British foreign policy in the Middle East. After two years out of Parliament, he served as Chancellor of the Exchequer in Stanley Baldwin's Conservative government, returning the pound sterling in 1925 to the gold standard at its pre-war parity, a move widely seen as creating deflationary pressure and depressing the UK economy. Out of government during his so-called wilderness years, in the 1930s, Churchill took the lead in calling for British rearmament to counter the growing threat of militarism in Nazi Germany. At the outbreak of the Second World War he was reappointed First Lord of the Admiralty. In May 1940, he became Prime Minister, succeeding Neville Chamberlain. Churchill formed a national government and oversaw British involvement in the Allied war effort against the Axis powers, resulting in victory in 1945. After the Conservatives' defeat in the 1945 general election, he became leader of the opposition. Amid the developing Cold War with the Soviet Union, he publicly warned of an «iron curtain» of Soviet influence in Europe and promoted European unity. Between his terms as Prime Minister, he wrote several books recounting his experience during the war. He was awarded the Nobel Prize for Literature in 1953. He lost the 1950 election but was returned to office in 1951. His second term was preoccupied with foreign affairs, especially Anglo-American relations and preservation of what remained of the British Empire with India now no longer part of it. Domestically, his government emphasized house-building and completed the development of a nuclear weapon, begun by his predecessor. Churchill was born on November 30, 1874 at his family's ancestral home, Blenheim Palace in Oxfordshire. On his father's side, he was a member of the British aristocracy as a direct descendant of John Churchill, 1st Duke of Marlborough. His father, Lord Randolph Churchill, representing the Conservative Party, 
had been elected member of parliament for Woodstock in 1874. His mother, Jenny, was a daughter of Leonard Jerome, a wealthy American businessman. In 1876, Churchill's paternal grandfather, John Spencer Churchill, 7th Duke of Marlborough, was appointed Viceroy of Ireland, then part of the United Kingdom. Randolph became his private secretary and the family relocated to Dublin. Winston's brother, Jack, was born there in 1880. Throughout much of the 1880s, Randolph and Jenny were effectively estranged, and the brothers were mostly cared for by their nanny, Elizabeth Everest. When she died in 1895, Churchill wrote that, she had been my dearest and most intimate friend during the whole of the twenty years I had lived. Churchill began boarding at St. George's School in Ascot, Berkshire, at age seven but was not academic and his behavior was poor. In 1884, he transferred to Brunswick School in Hove, where his academic performance improved. In April 1888, aged 13, he narrowly passed the entrance exam for Harrow School. His father wanted him to prepare for a military career and so his last three years at Harrow were in the army form. After two unsuccessful attempts to gain admittance to the Royal Military College, Sandhurst, he succeeded on his third. He was accepted as a cadet in the cavalry, starting in September 1893. His father died in January 1895, a month after Churchill graduated from Sandhurst. In February 1895, Churchill was commissioned as a second lieutenant in the 4th Queen's Own Hussars Regiment of the British Army, based at Aldershot. Eager to witness military action, he used his mother's influence to get himself posted to a war zone. In the autumn of 1895, he and his friend Reggie Barnes, then a subaltern, went to Cuba to observe the War of Independence and became involved in skirmishes after joining Spanish troops attempting to suppress independence fighters. Churchill sent reports about the conflict to the Daily Graphic in London. He proceeded to New York City and, in admiration of the United States, wrote to his mother about, what an extraordinary people the Americans are. With the Hussars, he went to Bombay in October 1896. Based in Bangalore, he was in India for 19 months, visiting Calcutta three times and joining expeditions to Hyderabad and the northwest frontier. In India, Churchill began a self-education project, reading a range of authors including Plato, Edward Gibbon, Charles Darwin and Thomas Babington Macaulay. The books were sent to him by his mother, with whom he shared frequent correspondence when abroad. In order to learn about politics, he also asked his mother to send him copies of the annual register, the political almanac. In one 1898 letter to her, he referred to his religious beliefs, saying, I do not accept the Christian or any other form of religious belief. Churchill had been christened in the Church of England but, as he related later, he underwent a virulently anti-Christian phase in his youth, and as an adult was an agnostic. In another letter to one of his cousins, he referred to religion as a delicious narcotic and expressed a preference for Protestantism over Roman Catholicism because he felt it a step nearer reason. Churchill volunteered to join Bindon Blood's Malakand Field Force in its campaign against Moment rebels in the Swat Valley of northwest India. Blood accepted him on condition that he was assigned as a journalist, the beginning of Churchill's writing career. He returned to Bangalore in October 1897 and there wrote his first book, The Story of the Malakand Field Force, which received positive reviews. He also wrote his only work of fiction, Savrola, a Ruritanian romance. To keep himself fully occupied, Churchill embraced writing as what Roy Jenkins calls his whole habit, especially through his political career when he was out of office. Writing was his main safeguard against recurring depression, which he referred to as his black dog. Using his contacts in London, Churchill got himself attached to General Kitchener's campaign in the Sudan as a 21st Lancer subaltern while, additionally, working as a journalist for the Morning Post. After fighting in the Battle of Omdurman on September 2, 1898, 
the 21st Lancers were stood down. In October, Churchill returned to England and began writing The River War, an account of the campaign which was published in November 1899, it was at this time that he decided to leave the army. He was critical of Kitchener's actions during the war, particularly the latter's unmerciful treatment of enemy wounded and his desecration of Muhammad Ahmed's tomb in Omdurman. On December 2, 1898, Churchill embarked for India to settle his military business and complete his resignation from the 4th Hussars. He spent a lot of his time there playing polo, the only ball sport in which he was ever interested. Having left the Hussars, he sailed from Bombay on March 20, 1899, determined to launch a career in politics, 46. Seeking a parliamentary career, Churchill spoke at conservative meetings and was selected as one of the party's two parliamentary candidates for the June 1899 by-election in Oldham, Lancashire. While campaigning in Oldham, Churchill referred to himself as a conservative and a Tory Democrat. Although the Oldham seats had previously been held by the Conservatives, the result was a narrow Liberal victory. Anticipating the outbreak of the Second Boer War between Britain and the Boer Republics, Churchill sailed to South Africa as a journalist for the Morning Post under the editorship of James Nicol Dunn. In October, he traveled to the conflict zone near Ladysmith, then besieged by Boer troops, before heading for Colenso. After his train was derailed by Boer artillery shelling, he was captured as a prisoner of war and interned in a Boer POW camp in Pretoria. In December, Churchill escaped from the prison and evaded his captors by stowing away aboard freight trains and hiding in a mine. He eventually made it to safety in Portuguese East Africa. His escape attracted much publicity. In January 1900, he briefly rejoined the army as a lieutenant in the South African Light Horse Regiment, joining Redvers Buller's fight to relieve the siege of Ladysmith and take Pretoria. He was among the first British troops into both places. He and his cousin, the Charles Spencer Churchill, 9th Duke of Marlborough, demanded and received the surrender of 52 Boer prison camp guards. Throughout the war, he had publicly chastised anti-Boer prejudices, calling for them to be treated with generosity and tolerance, and after the war he urged the British to be magnanimous in victory. In July, having resigned his lieutenancy, he returned to Britain. His Morning Post dispatches had been published as London to Ladysmith via Pretoria and had sold well. Churchill rented a flat in London's Mayfair, using it as his base for the next six years. He stood again as one of the Conservative candidates at Oldham in the October 1900 general election, securing a narrow victory to become a Member of Parliament at age 25. In the same month, he published Ian Hamilton's March, a book about his South African experiences, which became the focus of a lecture tour in November through Britain, America and Canada. Members of Parliament were unpaid and the tour was a financial necessity. In America, Churchill met Mark Twain, President McKinley and Vice President Theodore Roosevelt, he did not get on well with Roosevelt. Later, in spring 1901, he gave more lectures in Paris, Madrid and Gibraltar. Asquith succeeded the terminally ill Campbell Bannerman on April 8, 1908 and, for days later, Churchill was appointed President of the Board of Trade, succeeding Lloyd George who became Chancellor of the Exchequer. Aged 33, Churchill was the youngest cabinet member since 1866. Newly appointed cabinet ministers were legally obliged to seek re-election at a by-election and on April 24, Churchill lost the Manchester North West by-election to the Conservative candidate by 429 votes. On May 9, the Liberals stood him in the safe seat of Dundee, where he won comfortably. In private life, Churchill proposed marriage to Clementine Hosier, they were married on September 12, 1908 at St. Margaret's, Westminster and honeymooned in Bovino, Venice, and Vevery Castle in Moravia. They lived at 33, Eccleston Square, London, and their first daughter, Diana, was born in July 1909. 
Churchill and Clementine were married for over 56 years until his death. The success of his marriage was important to Churchill's career as Clementine's unbroken affection provided him with a secure and happy background. One of Churchill's first tasks as a minister was to arbitrate in an industrial dispute among ship workers and employers on the River Tyne. He afterwards established a standing court of arbitration to deal with future industrial disputes, establishing a reputation as a conciliator. In cabinet, he worked with Lloyd George to champion social reform. He promoted what he called a network of state intervention and regulation akin to that in Germany. Continuing Lloyd George's work, Churchill introduced the Mines Eight Hours Bill, which legally prohibited miners from working more than an eight-hour day. In 1909, he introduced the Trade Boards Bill, creating trade boards which could prosecute exploitative employers. Passing with a large majority, it established the principle of a minimum wage and the right of workers to have meal breaks. In May 1909, he proposed the Labor Exchanges Bill to establish over 200 labor exchanges through which the unemployed would be assisted in finding employment. He also promoted the idea of an unemployment insurance scheme, which would be part funded by the state. To ensure funding for their reforms, Lloyd George and Churchill denounced Reginald McKenna's policy of naval expansion, refusing to believe that war with Germany was inevitable. As Chancellor, Lloyd George presented his People's Budget on April 29, 1909, calling it a war budget to eliminate poverty. With Churchill as his closest ally, Lloyd George proposed unprecedented taxes on the rich to fund the liberal welfare programs. The budget was vetoed by the conservative peers who dominated the House of Lords. His social reforms under threat, Churchill became president of the Budget League, and warned that upper-class obstruction could anger working-class Britons and lead to class war. The government called the January 1910 general election, which resulted in a narrow liberal victory, Churchill retained his seat at Dundee. After the election, he proposed the abolition of the House of Lords in a cabinet memorandum, suggesting that it be succeeded either by a unicameral system or by a new, smaller second chamber that lacked an inbuilt advantage for the Conservatives. In April, the Lords relented and the People's Budget passed into law. Churchill continued to campaign against the House of Lords and assisted passage of the Parliament Act 1911 which reduced and restricted its powers. In February 1910, Churchill was promoted to Home Secretary, giving him control over the police and prison services, he implemented a prison reform program. Measures included a distinction between criminal and political prisoners, with prison rules for the latter being relaxed. There were educational innovations like the establishment of libraries for prisoners, and a requirement for each prison to stage entertainments four times a year. The rules on solitary confinement were relaxed somewhat, and Churchill proposed the abolition of automatic imprisonment of those who failed to pay fines. Imprisonment of people aged between 16 and 21 was abolished except for the most serious offenses. Churchill reduced, commuted, 21 of the 43 death, capital, sentences passed while he was Home Secretary. One of the major domestic issues in Britain was women's suffrage. Churchill supported giving women the vote, but he would only back a bill to that effect if it had majority support from the male electorate. His proposed solution was a referendum on the issue, but this found no favor with Asquith and women's suffrage remained unresolved until 1918. Many suffragettes believed that Churchill was a committed opponent of women's suffrage, and targeted his meetings for protest. In November 1910, the suffragist Hugh Franklin attacked Churchill with a whip, Franklin was arrested and imprisoned for six weeks. In November 1910, Churchill had to deal with the Tony Pandy riots, in which coal miners in the Rhondda Valley violently protested against their working conditions. The chief constable of Glamorgan requested troops to help police quell the rioting. Churchill, learning that the troops were already traveling, allowed them to go as far as Swindon and Cardiff, but blocked their deployment, he was concerned that the use of troops could lead to bloodshed. 
Instead he sent 270 London police, who were not equipped with firearms, to assist their Welsh counterparts. As the riots continued, he offered the protesters an interview with the government's chief industrial arbitrator, which they accepted. Privately, Churchill regarded both the mine owners and striking miners as being very unreasonable. The Times and other media outlets accused him of being too soft on the rioters, in contrast, many in the Labour Party, which was linked to the trade unions, regarded him as having been too heavy-handed. In consequence of the latter, Churchill incurred the long-term suspicion of the labor movement. January 1911, Churchill became involved in the siege of Sydney Street, three Latvian burglars had killed several police officers and hidden in a house in the east end of London, which was surrounded by police. Churchill stood with the police though he did not direct their operation. After the house caught fire, he told the fire brigade not to proceed into the house because of the threat posed by the armed men. Afterwards, two of the burglars were found dead. Although he faced criticism for his decision, he stated that he thought it better to let the house burn down rather than spend good British lives in rescuing those ferocious rascals. In October 1911, Asquith appointed Churchill First Lord of the Admiralty, and he took up official residence at Admiralty House. He created a naval war staff and, over the next two and a half years, focused on naval preparation, visiting naval stations and dockyards, seeking to improve morale, and scrutinizing German naval developments. After the German government passed its 1912 naval law to increase warship production, Churchill vowed that Britain would do the same and that for every new battleship built by the Germans, Britain would build two. He invited Germany to engage in a mutual de-escalation of naval building projects, but this was refused. Churchill pushed for higher pay and greater recreational facilities for naval staff, an increase in the building of submarines, and a renewed focus on the Royal Naval Air Service, encouraging them to experiment with how aircraft could be used for military purposes. 156. He coined the term seaplane and ordered 100 to be constructed. Some liberals objected to his levels of naval expenditure, in December 1913 he threatened to resign if his proposal for four new battleships in 1914-15 was rejected. In June 1914, he convinced the House of Commons to authorize the government purchase of a 51% share in the profits of oil produced by the Anglo-Persian Oil Company, to secure continued oil access for the Royal Navy. As First Lord, Churchill was tasked with overseeing Britain's naval effort when the First World War began in August 1914. In the same month, the Navy transported 120,000 British troops to France and began a blockade of Germany's North Sea ports. Churchill sent submarines to the Baltic Sea to assist the Russian Navy and he sent the Marine Brigade to Ostend, forcing a reallocation of German troops. In September, Churchill assumed full responsibility for Britain's aerial defense. On October 7, Clementine gave birth to their third child, Sarah. In October, Churchill visited Antwerp to observe Belgian defenses against the besieging Germans and promised British reinforcements for the city. Soon afterwards, Antwerp fell to the Germans and Churchill was criticized in the press. He maintained that his actions had prolonged resistance and enabled the Allies to secure Calais and Dunkirk. In November, Asquith called a war council, consisting of himself, Lloyd George, Edward Grey, Kitchener, and Churchill. Churchill set the development of the tank on the right track and financed its creation with admiralty funds. Churchill was interested in the Middle Eastern theater and wanted to relieve pressure on the Russians in the Caucasus by staging attacks against Turkey in the Dardanelles. He hoped that the British could even seize Constantinople. Approval was given and, in March 1915, an Anglo-French task force attempted a naval bombardment of Turkish defenses in the Dardanelles. In April, the Mediterranean Expeditionary Force, including the Australian and New Zealand Army Corps, ANZAC, began its assault at Gallipoli. Both campaigns failed and Churchill was held by many MPs, 
particularly conservatives, to be personally responsible. In May, Asquith agreed under parliamentary pressure to form an all-party coalition government, but the conservatives' condition of entry was that Churchill must be removed from the Admiralty. Churchill pleaded his case with both Asquith and conservative leader Bonner Law but had to accept a motion and became Chancellor of the Duchy of Lancaster. On November 25, 1915, Churchill resigned from the government, although he remained an MP Asquith rejected his request to be appointed Governor-General of British East Africa. Churchill decided to return to active service with the army and was attached to the 2nd Grenadier Guards, on the Western Front. In January 1916, he was temporarily promoted to Lieutenant Colonel and given command of the 6th Royal Scots Fusiliers. After a period of training, the battalion was moved to a sector of the Belgian Front near Plogsteert. For over three months, they faced continual shelling although no German offensive. Churchill narrowly escaped death when, during a visit by his staff officer cousin the 9th Duke of Marlborough, a large piece of shrapnel fell between them. In May, the 6th Royal Scots Fusiliers were merged into the 15th Division. Churchill did not request a new command, instead securing permission to leave active service. His temporary promotion ended on May 16, 1916, when he returned to the rank of Major. In October 1916, Asquith resigned as Prime Minister and was succeeded by Lloyd George who, in May 1917, sent Churchill to inspect the French war effort. In July, Churchill was appointed Minister of Munitions. He quickly negotiated an end to a strike in munitions factories along the Clyde and increased munitions production. It was in his October 1917 letter to the attention of his cabinet colleagues that he penned the plan of attack for the next year that would bring final victory to the Allies. He ended a second strike, in June 1918, by threatening to conscript strikers into the army. In the House of Commons, Churchill voted in support of the Representation of the People Act 1918, which gave some British women the right to vote. In November 1918, four days after the armistice, Churchill's fourth child, Marigold, was born. With the war over, Lloyd George called a general election with voting on Saturday, December 14, 1918. During the election campaign, Churchill called for the nationalization of the railways, a control on monopolies, tax reform, and the creation of a League of Nations to prevent future wars. He was returned as MP for Dundee and, although the Conservatives won a majority, Lloyd George was retained as Prime Minister. In January 1919, Lloyd George moved Churchill to the War Office as both Secretary of State for War and Secretary of State for Air. Churchill was responsible for demobilizing the British Army, although he convinced Lloyd George to keep a million men conscripted for the British Army of the Rhine. Churchill was one of the few government figures who opposed harsh measures against the defeated Germany, and he cautioned against demobilizing the German army, warning that they might be needed as a bulwark against threats from the newly established Soviet Russia. He was an outspoken opponent of Vladimir Lenin's new Communist Party government in Russia. He initially supported the use of British troops to assist the anti-communist white forces in the Russian Civil War, but soon recognized the desire of the British people to bring them home. After the Soviets won the Civil War, Churchill proposed a cordon sanitaire around the country. In the Irish War of Independence, he supported the use of the paramilitary black and tans to combat Irish revolutionaries. After British troops in Iraq clashed with Kurdish rebels, Churchill authorized two squadrons to the area, proposing that they be equipped with poison gas to be used to inflict punishment upon recalcitrant natives without inflicting grave injury upon them, although this was never implemented. There is debate as to whether this would have included mustard gas or otherwise lacrimatory gas, tear gas. More broadly, he saw the occupation of Iraq as a drain on Britain and proposed, unsuccessfully, that the government should hand control of central and northern Iraq back to Turkey.
Churchill became Secretary of State for the Colonies in February 1921. The following month, the first exhibit of his paintings was held, it took place in Paris, with Churchill exhibiting under a pseudonym. In May, his mother died, followed in August by his two-year-old daughter Marigold who died from septicemia. Marigold's death devastated her parents and Churchill was haunted by the tragedy for the rest of his life. In September 1922, the Chanak Crisis erupted as Turkish forces threatened to occupy the Dardanelles neutral zone, which was policed by the British Army based in Chanak, now Kanakale. Churchill and Lloyd George favored military resistance to any Turkish advance but the majority conservatives in the coalition government opposed it. A political debacle ensued which resulted in the conservative withdrawal from the government, precipitating the November 1922 general election. Also in September, Churchill's fifth and last child, Mary, was born, and in the same month he purchased Chartwell, in Kent, which became his family home for the rest of his lifetime. In October 1922, he underwent an operation for appendicitis. While he was in hospital, Lloyd George's coalition was dissolved. In the general election, Churchill lost his Dundee seat to Edwin Scrimgeer, a prohibitionist candidate. Later, he wrote that he was, without an office, without a seat, without a party, and without an appendix. Still, he could be satisfied with his elevation as one of 50 members of the Order of the Companions of Honor, as named in Lloyd George's 1922 Dissolution Honors List. Churchill spent much of the next six months at the Villa Rev d'Or near Cannes, where he devoted himself to painting and writing his memoirs. He wrote an autobiographical history of the war, The World Crisis. The first volume was published in April 1923 and the rest over the next ten years. After the 1923 general election was called, seven liberal associations asked Churchill to stand as their candidate, and he selected Lester West, but he did not win the seat. A Labour government led by Ramsay MacDonald took power. Churchill had hoped they would be defeated by a conservative liberal coalition. He strongly opposed the MacDonald government's decision to loan money to Soviet Russia and feared the signing of an Anglo-Soviet treaty. In July, he agreed with Conservative leader Stanley Baldwin that he would be selected as a Conservative candidate in the next general election, which was held on October 29. Churchill stood at Epping, but he described himself as a «constitutionalist». The Conservatives were victorious, and Baldwin formed the new government. Although Churchill had no background in finance or economics, Baldwin appointed him as Chancellor of the Exchequer. Becoming Chancellor on November 6, 1924, Churchill formally rejoined the Conservative Party. As Chancellor, he intended to pursue his free trade principles in the form of laissez-faire economics, as under the liberal social reforms. In April 1925, he controversially albeit reluctantly restored the gold standard in his first budget at its 1914 parody against the advice of some leading economists including John Maynard Keynes. The return to gold is held to have caused deflation and resultant unemployment with a devastating impact on the coal industry. Churchill presented five budgets in all to April 1929. Among his measures were reduction of the state pension age from 70 to 65, immediate provision of widows' pensions, reduction of military expenditure, income tax reductions and imposition of taxes on luxury items. During the general strike of 1926, Churchill edited the British Gazette, the government's anti-strike propaganda newspaper. After the strike ended, he acted as an intermediary between striking miners and their employers. He later called for the introduction of a legally binding minimum wage. In a House of Commons speech in 1926 Churchill made his unique feelings on the issue of Irish unity clear. He stated that Ireland should be united within itself but also, united to the British Empire. In early 1927, Churchill visited Rome where he met Mussolini, whom he praised for his stand against Leninism. <laughs>
In the 1929 general election, Churchill retained his Epping seat, but the Conservatives were defeated, and MacDonald formed his second Labour government. Out of office, Churchill was prone to depression, his black dog, but addressed this by writing. He began work on Marlborough, His Life and Times, a four-volume biography of his ancestor John Churchill, 1st Duke of Marlborough. It was by this time that he had developed a reputation for being a heavy drinker of alcoholic beverages, although Jenkins believes that was often exaggerated. Hoping that the Labour government could be ousted, he gained Baldwin's approval to work towards establishing a conservative liberal coalition, although many liberals were reluctant. In October 1930, after his return from a trip to North America, Churchill published his autobiography, My Early Life, which sold well and was translated into multiple languages.